if you would like to leave any appreciative comments. Um, if you have specific questions for the panelists, uh, you can use the Q&A box and we will get to those questions um, toward the end of the session. Um, if you have any book recommendations as well, feel free to leave that in the chat because we are always game for hearing what you're reading, what you're enjoying reading. Um, and I am particularly interested in books written by Canadians about their immigration experience. So feel free to leave that too. And hello from Richmond and Victoria. That's funny, I've lived in both of those places. <laughs> So we'll just give everyone a little bit more time to come in and then we'll get started. And also in the chat, you'll notice that you can um, use the drop down menu to choose who you would like to chat with. So you can either chat to all the panelists or all the panelists and the attendees. Um, so just so you know. And hello from Alberta. Nice to see you here. Okay, and it's four o'clock, so we're going to officially get started. So we would like to acknowledge that this festival takes place on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people. I believe that as immigrants and settlers, we have a responsibility to learn the history of the land that we live on and to understand its present day issues. And I think that one of the great ways that we can do this is through a festival just like this one, where we've created space to learn, to have conversations. And I would just like to say a thank you to Word Vancouver for creating this kind of space for these types of conversations. And if you haven't already checked out the rest of the programming for the weekend, I really encourage you to do that. There's a lot of diverse voices that will be speaking, sharing important stories, and uh, you can find all of that in the schedule at wordvancouver.ca. Um, and Word Vancouver would like to take a moment to thank our generous donors and sponsors. The Canada Arts Council, Canada Periodical Fund, Heritage Canada, the BC Arts Council, Creative BC, Downtown Vancouver Business Improvement Association, the City of Vancouver, the Vancouver Public Library, Simon Fraser University, the Writers Studio, the Writers Union of Canada, the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, Crime Writers of Canada, Children's Writers and Illustrators of BC, and so many more. Thank you so much. Without you, this free festival could not happen. And for those of you tuning in, if you would like to join and um, support this free festival, we'll be dropping some links in the chat. You can see that uh, there's a direct link there to support for anyone who would like to make a donation. We also have a really fun program called Adore an Author, which is where you get to select an author that has participated in this festival and show your appreciation by making a donation uh, in their name. And you will get a copy of their book and even a little shout out. And there is a silent auction also available if you um, would like to treat yourself or a loved one to something from that. It's this type of uh, uh, support that actually allows us to access this great festival for free. And we would also like to thank our official bookseller, Iron Dog Books, for their continued support. They're also linked in this chat, um, so you may want to consider them for your next book purchase. Okay, so I am Thuslam Jaffer, and I'm a freelance writer, editor, and I'm currently pursuing my MFA in creative nonfiction. Uh, my work in progress is actually a memoir and essays, and I write it from my perspective as a first generation Canadian mother. And the themes of my book are culture, identity and home, which is exactly the themes of today's panel, back where I came from. Um, with me today are Angie, Natasha and Linton, who are also first generation Canadians who love to talk about these things and who have some great stories and insights to share uh, from trips that they have taken back to their motherlands or their family's country of origin. So 
I will just tell you a little bit about them before jumping into some questions. And once again, for those of you who joined in after I said this, um, at the bottom, you will notice a chat box, which I see some of you have already used. So if you have any comments throughout the session, please post them there. But I particularly want to draw your attention to the Q&A box. If you have specific questions for the panelists, leave them there and we will try to get to them before the end of the session. Okay, so Angie, Angie Tian Tian Yu was born in Jiangsu province. She moved to Vancouver, Canada in 2000 with her parents and grew up here thereafter. Angie identifies as bicultural, which she defines as having retained enough memories of her early childhood in China and subsequently spending her formative years growing up in Canada. As an adult, Angie moved back to China for an internship opportunity where she learned about the country, about her family, and about herself. Since returning to Vancouver, she has been reconciling her two conflicting childhoods of East versus West, collectivist versus individualist. Today, Angie continues to tell stories via her writing and producing a podcast from the perspective of a 1.5 generation Chinese immigrant. Natasha Jashani, is the owner of Career Contacts, an HR and recruitment consulting firm. Through Career Contacts, she supports clients looking for temporary staff, permanent employees, and executive and leadership hires. She is also the author of the number one best-selling career services book, The HR Insider, How to Land Your Dream Job and Keep It. Natasha holds a sociology degree from UBC and an HR management certificate with distinction from BCIT. Linton Choki is a digital marketer and has written for Cold Tea Collective, a digital publication for and by Asian millennials. Born in South Africa, Linton moved to Canada when he was very young. He has traveled to South Africa and China to explore his roots and his heritage. Thank you so much for being here today. It's really great to see you all. Um, we've had conversations in the past about being first generation Canadian and about your trips back home or back to your parents' home. And um, I'm really excited to share your stories here. So the first question I have, which is for all of you, is uh, what was the motivation behind planning a trip to your country of origin? So why did you decide to go on this trip and also prior to going, did you have any expectations? Did you have any reservations? Um, so Angie, could we start with you? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, so, hello everyone, my name is Angie. Um, thank you, Taplin, for such a good introduction. Um, I definitely had some reservations prior to uh, moving back. I think I went into it with very little expectations because I, uh, as you mentioned, um, I had an internship lined up. Um, I found a place to live online. So my basics were covered, but I think I was very nervous about um, what life would be like. Um, but because it was temporary, because it's a contract, um, I think I, I don't think this is something that I would be able to do now. <laughs> This is definitely something, you know, like young, freshly graduated Angie was able to do. Um, what motivated me was that, uh, so as, as Taslam mentioned, I was born in China and, and as I grew up here in Canada, it, I just became more and more um, dissimil like disfamil like unfamiliar with mm -hmm. what my homeland was like. And every time I visited, which was quite far apart, um, it was like visiting a new country. So my main motivation behind it was that I really wanted to understand the changes that uh, my motherland has gone through since I left. Yeah. Great, thank you. Natasha? So for me, I traveled back to India, which is where my dad was born and raised. and. The motivation for us was that there was family there that was not going to be able to attend my wedding. Um, and I wanted to go and do uh, sort of a traditional Indian shopping uh, experience the first time that we were crossing international borders as a family. 
and sort of my last trip um, living at home with my parents. And so it was, it was a combination of a trip to bond, a trip to see where he'd come from. Um, and in terms of expectations, my dad had really romanticized India. It was, uh, there was such a dichotomy between his stories and what I could see on TV or what I could see in movies. And so for me, it was really about learning for myself what I saw in the country through my own eyes and then having the privilege of being able to see it with him through his eyes also. Um, and so that really allowed me to experience India in a way I don't think I ever would have had an opportunity to had he not been by my side on that trip. And I can say with like a full heart that I'd, and nothing that I had assumed would be India was the case. Um, I don't think anything, any of the stories that he told really were justified until I was able to experience it and touch it and taste it and smell it. Um, and so that was sort of how that journey began for me going back to India. That's lovely. And that's actually something I can really relate to. I forgot to mention uh, before is that this topic actually was spurred because I went on a trip with my dad uh, last year uh, to Mombasa, Kenya, which is where my family's from and where I was born. And I can totally relate, Natasha, to your experience of doing it with him uh, be and seeing it through his eyes and not just your eyes and, and sharing that experience with him. So I look forward to hearing more about that as yeah. well. Thanks. And Linton, how about you? You traveled back to South Africa. Yeah, so um, I'm ethnically Chinese, uh, but I was born in South Africa. My parents were born and raised in South Africa, so I'm pretty far removed from my homeland in China. Um, but uh, in 2016, I uh, had an opportunity to take a long trip to South Africa for six weeks. I hadn't been back since I was a kid, so I really wanted to go experience South Africa uh, coming in from an adult perspective uh, rather than a child perspective and um, really just learn and keep an open mind to what to experience in Africa. Now, South Africa is always known, has been known as a dangerous place. And I grew up with all these narratives about how dangerous the place was and never really heard anything good about it. Um, so I really wanted to go there with an open mind. And it was, I'm really glad that I did uh, because you know, I came away with it thinking that you know, South Africa is a great place. There's lots of safe places there to enjoy and to really experience South Africa for all the beauty that it has. Um, and it's just like going to LA. There's certain parts of LA you just do not go to. Um, but I think one of the more important things was being able to reconnect with family there and I have a lot of family there still, a lot of extended family, family friends, and they all welcomed me with open arms. Um, I had another goal when I went there was to reconnect and connect with uh, some of the elders um, because I am so far removed from China that I wanted to understand and learn a little bit more about the origins there. Uh, so I was able to connect with uh, my mom's uncle who told me about the village that they're from and everything like that. So this precipitated this whole trip to taking my mom to her village. She's never seen it before, never been there before. I've never seen it. She's, uh, you know, it was just an amazing trip. And I had done that same thing with my dad as well. But I had to lay down the expectations with both my parents that, again, there's this, they grew up with this really romanticized view of the village, right? Rice paddy fields, mountains, traditional ancient homes, everything like that. We don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it could be a factory. It could be a garbage dump. We have no idea, right? So, um, but fortunately, uh, all the villages that we went to were absolutely gorgeous, absolutely beautiful, and again, uh, really welcoming, and uh, it was really great. Great. And I'm curious, uh, Linton, did you, since part of your journey was to explore your roots, have you ever uh, written about that, or did you document that in any form? Um, I, I kind of did, but I took it as more of an instructional way um, because there was a lot of work and investigative work that I had to do and a lot of research that I had to do uh, to go find the villages um, because, I mean, there's a disconnect in terms of the internet versus North America and China. So being able to find the villages in China is kind of challenging if you don't know how to speak the language, you know, and whatnot. So if you don't know how to use the tools and systems that China uses, um, so say, for example, the Google version in China is called Baidu and, you know, there's 
an incredible amount of information on there. But if you don't know how to write or anything like that, it's difficult to find. So I had to use the resources available to me, which was Google Maps and everything. So it was a bit challenging. And um, I honestly, like even my dad's village, I found serendipitously, I didn't like, I had to, I was like scrolling around Google Maps trying to find the village and all of a sudden I found it. Um, so it wasn't that like someone told me, oh, this is where the village is on the map. Like I had to go find it myself. So being able to detail that and give kind of tips and tricks on how to do this yourself if you're kind of similar situations to me. Yeah. Yeah, and that actually leads me to my next question is, while you were away, and this is for all of you, how did you connect with the culture there? Um, and I'm thinking in terms of like food, language, uh, other norms, whether they're, you know, written or unspoken norms. How did you connect with that having grown up here in Canada? What was uh, what were your experiences like? Were there uh, times that you felt like absolutely a foreigner in a place where, uh, you know, maybe your parents grew up? Um, would anyone like to take that on first? Sure. Um, so for me, I, when we went there, we went with a lot of fear built into that trip. So everything from, you know, take your malaria pills, don't drink the water, be mindful of your belongings, take off your jewelry. I mean, there were so many um, assumptions made about the safety from a health perspective, from, from a physical perspective. So I walked into to India with a baseline of fear. I was afraid of mm -hmm. everything, right? And so when I actually got there, um, the piece for me that was immediate was the heat. I was not prepared at all for the weather. Um, and so that took adjusting. I was not prepared for the food. Um, I, my mom is from East Africa and my dad is from India. Um, I grew up always acknowledging the food I ate as Indian food. That's what we refer to our food as. Mm -hmm. And I got to India and realized I don't eat Indian food. I eat East African food. That is what my mom cooks for us. So the food was completely foreign. I mean, outside of what you think you, you understand of uh, Indian food to be in Canada, um, it was very different. Um, and so we, we got to try these incredible different uh, fruits and um I'm a big sugar girl, so there's a ton of different sweets that you can get. Um, and we had an opportunity to try all of these different things I'd never even heard of. Mm -hmm. um, and then also experience things that you, in the moment, you feel, um, at least for me, I felt really bad because I judged every moment. You know, you'd go to a street market and they would give you food and they'd be making it with their hands and they'd be pouring it with, there, there was no utensils. There was, and I, thinking like, how is this okay? This would never fly at home. Um, and yet that was just the norm. And we ate the food and none of us got sick and it was all fine. Um, and you made a comment about whether you felt like a foreigner or if you ever felt like a foreigner while you were on the trip. Yeah. Uh, there was never a moment on that trip where I actually felt at home. I felt like a foreigner the entire time. Mm. Um, and that wasn't surprising to me because I, my connection to India is my dad, not the country itself. And so I was building that connection for the very first time. And so I respected the fact that I was new to that land. But the piece that I, and I remember sharing this last summer as well, that I found really hard to watch is that my dad doesn't identify as a foreigner. That's his home. That was his home for 30 plus years. And so when he went back, he was treated like a foreigner. Mm -hmm. And that was not something that he was prepared for. Um, and did not do well with because you know there are in India everything is split up so you have like a foreigner's line and a local's line and every single time my dad would gravitate towards the local line Giddy, because boy, boy, that's his that's his home um, and time and time again he had to be told that he was a foreigner and that was very hard for him so for us we had a hard time watching him go through that experience of returning home and introducing us to what he felt was home and being um, being received as a foreigner. That was really challenging. Yeah, that is a, a very interesting perspective. And I can't really imagine what that would be like because um, I saw that same thing happen to my dad last year after 40 years of being away. He went back thinking he was just going to slip right into the scene and 
right away I learned the word for foreigner in Swahili very quickly because it was like <laughs> we were just assumed to be and even though he spoke Swahili back and was like no I'm from here there was just something that they knew like I don't know if it was like pheromones or some Canadian pheromones <laughs> we were giving off but people just knew um yeah and I totally relate to the malaria pills I was nervous to take I was nervous about getting malaria but then I was also nervous to take the pills because of the side effects. I think I called my <laughs> pharmacist like three times before I left, like, are you sure I need to take this? But yeah, thank you so much. It's a lot there. Okay, how about Linton or Angie who would like to talk about their experience with the culture? I'll go first. Uh, <laughs> so I wasn't afraid of malaria. I was more afraid of getting shot or like <laughs> um, But I... Uh, you know, it was, it was fine. And in fact, it was interesting in South Africa that it was actually better for me to utilize the fact I was a foreigner and I would get more stuff because of it. I would have more privilege because of it. Um, so it was interesting in how I utilized that. And even in China too, same thing, like how I utilized being a Westerner um, or coming from a Western background uh, to, you know, get certain things. Obviously, there's other things that you can't get, like, you know, there's like the lines, but not necessarily lines, but prices, prices for locals, prices for people who speak Mandarin versus the dialect, prices for people who don't speak the language at all, right? So um, that was one thing that we did encounter, but I think it was fine. Uh, one thing I would like to talk about, though, too, is that um, as much as I felt foreign, I knew I was going to feel foreign there. So I didn't necessarily take that as an insult or, you know, felt judged in that kind of way. But how I actually realized uh, later on that I was indigenous there, right? Like in China, like I, I'm indigenous, right? And how that kind of relates back to indigeneity. Um, so that was an interesting realization that I had only recently. Um, so I'm still trying to work that out and figure out what that means for me. Um, but yeah, I just thought I'd share that. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good point, Linton, and, and speaks to the topic of home. Like where do we, where can we lay claim to home? And I, I go through, you know, that question as well, because ethnically I'm Indian, but my family hasn't been in India for over a hundred years. So can I call myself, can I, you know, can I call myself Indian? Um, but do I also, can I call myself East African? Cause I'm not indigenous to Kenya. So yeah, these are great uh, questions that I think with our rich, uh, and complex histories, you know, we think about these things, and uh, and it is part of Canadian um, a Canadian collective as well, because there are so so many of us who have these kinds of histories before coming to Canada. And I just want to jump to the chat. I see that somebody's asking for the definition of first generation immigrant. Thanks for that question, Ariana. Um, for our intents and purposes. Uh, we're using the definition that I believe that the government of Canada uses, which is a first generation Canadian is someone um, who is born elsewhere and then moves to Canada or is born in Canada to immigrant parents. So as it turns out in my home, actually, um, like my parents are first generation Canadian and so am I because we were born elsewhere, but my brother who was born in Canada is also a first generation Canadian because he's born to immigrant parents. So that's, uh, that's the definition we're going with here. I hope that helps. Um, okay, sorry, Angie, did you want to share your Yeah, um, actually to jump off on the uh, labeling, uh, <laughs> I always categorize myself as uh, 1.5 generation, which I mentioned in my bio as well. Right. And usually when people are like, what does that mean? And I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> But it's whatever, um, whatever I try to assign to it, which is, you know, like yourself, my parents and I were born elsewhere, and I spent half of my childhood elsewhere, half of my childhood here in Canada. So for me, I, I really do feel like I'm stuck in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for my parents, when they when they go back to China, they're visiting their parents, and they're visiting their a place where they spend like the first 40 years of their life. And for, for myself, when I go back, it's more like reconciling 
that I had this whole life mm -hmm. before I moved to Canada. And, and Canada is my primary home. English is my primary language, even though it's my second language. And Vancouver is my primary home, even though it's my second home. So yeah, so I think like what you what you guys said, like it, I think it's really interesting, like what is home? And um, I, I digress, but I think the original question that you had was, um, the food and culture and language. Um, so I am very fortunate to be bilingual. I speak Mandarin fluently. Um, so I really didn't think that communication was going to be an issue at all. And it was probably the biggest issue. <laughs> because, um, because the part that I'm from in China um, is, is like, first of all, it's like 1500 kilometers away from where I ended up doing my internship. So wow. very far away, mm -hmm. like three hours by flight kind of situation. And, um, and there's a lot in between. <laughs> I, think, I think that's the key as well. There's a lot in between those 1500 kilometers. And it was like two completely different countries nearly. Even when my mom came to visit me, she was like, I don't know where I am. <laughs> and um, even though the locals speak Mandarin, they use a lot of different vocabulary, a lot of different intonation, um, to the point where I, I really found myself lost at time. There was this really funny uh, interaction that I had with a, um, a package delivery man where he called me and he's like, hey, um, what he said was teacher you. Um, like in Mandarin, it would be like yu lao shi, which means teacher you. Like, you know, if you would call someone like teacher choki, right? Like it would be like um, choki lao shi, right? So he's like, oh, like I have a package for teacher you. And I'm like, oh, I think you have the wrong number. So he's like, okay, okay. He hangs up, calls me again. He's like, I have a package for teacher you. And I'm like, so confused. And he double checks my number, double checks my address. It's all right. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna come down. So I go downstairs, he shows me a package. I'm like, yeah, that's my package, but I'm not a teacher. <laughs> and he looks at me with this like blank stare. He's like, and he kind of just, coyishly smiles and then leaves because he's like I don't have time for this I have like a hundred <laughs> packages to deliver and the next day I go to uh, go to work and I tell them what happened and uh my and the you know the locals that were working at the embassy were just they were like on the floor laughing they're like oh teacher is like a term of respect mm -hmm. so instead of calling somebody like Mr. You or Mrs. You they actually have a gender neutral term and they call everybody teacher out of respect, which I thought was really interesting because yeah, like I, I like completely blew my mind. Here, there I was standing, staring at this delivery man telling him I'm not a teacher. And he's just like, <laughs> I don't, I didn't ask what you did for a living. So anyway, so that was like an example of, you know, the language, like we completely understand what each other is saying, even though we don't really understand what each other is Aww. saying. Yeah. So you, you could understand the literal word, like you could translate the word, but not the actual meaning behind it in that's that right. context. There's, exactly. Yeah. There's no context. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when I really felt like a foreigner. Yeah. Yeah. I like the funny stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's some really great comments in the, in the chat as well of people feeling like they belong to neither place, but also to both. And, um, Del Lobo was saying that it's a very, very rich thing, really, and it, and it can be, it can be confusing, but it, it does, it, it, there is a beauty in the complexity of it, I think. Okay. Um, so there's this question that kind of irks a lot of, uh, of people uh, when they're asked, where are you from? And we get asked that question here in Canada, but I'm curious to know, first of all, did you get asked that question when, you're, when you were away? I'm going to guess yes, um, but I'd like to know how you responded to that question while you were away. Hmm. Um, so, mm -hmm. oh, 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 sorry, I'll start. Um, so it, it, in China, it's interesting that people, when I say that I'm from Canada, it's seen as a sign of prestige. So um, yeah, I had that again. So that again, like, I guess maybe a male Chinese guy from Canada, like it's, there's a lot of privilege there, right? Um, in China. 
but the interesting thing was when I was in South Africa, that um, one time I was at a bar with my uncle. Um, so two Chinese guys at a bar on the patio having a beer and, you know, two on two separate occasions, people came up to us and be like, hey, like, what's it like in China? And, you know, my uncle, he he was born, raised in South Africa. He's lived there all his life and everything like that. Like I was born there and he was like, no, we're from here. They're like, and they were floored. They're absolutely shocked. They could not believe that Chinese people were in like born and raised in South Africa. An interesting thing to me too, was that like one of those people was an Indian person who I thought and maybe misconstrued that they would have uh, more empathy or relate better to that, but they didn't. So I think that's kind of when I felt like a real foreigner there in South Africa was when the locals could not understand that Chinese people had a long history in South Africa. So that's when I felt like a foreigner. But in Canada, like I've never felt like that ever. I've had that question posed to me a lot, but it was only in South Africa that I felt that way. So when you're in Canada and someone asks you, where are you from? How do you respond and how do you feel about that? It's usually a point of interest. Oh, you're Chinese from South Africa? So there's that kind of novelty for them. So mm -hmm. that is a point of interest, but I don't know why I felt more slighted in South Africa. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I think, oh, oh sorry. Oh, I was just um, gonna, uh, yep. Go ahead, Angie. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, the sun just came out, which is great, but <laughs> now I can't really see. Um, I actually have the complete opposite um, as Linton. Um, I feel a lot of contention here in Vancouver. I think because there's a lot of animosity from the general consensus towards a lot of mainland Chinese people. So when people ask me, where am I from? I'm all of, all of a sudden, I'm on defensive mode. And, and this is something that I have to, you know, that I've had to learn how to be more mindful of is to not jump to conclusions that the other person has negative intentions. Um, and just to be like, hey, maybe it's a point of interest, like, like Linton mentioned. So in Canada, I'm always, I, I think just from the experiences I have had with people who, who came from a place of ignorance or where I have had negative experiences, all of a sudden, when I'm faced with that question, it's very much like, I'm from here. Like, I, this is my home, because I think it's because some people find it difficult to believe that. Um, and I, because I actually do live here, that when people, some, when someone asks me that, um, it almost feels like, but, but I would never ask you that question, kind of mm -hmm. thing. Uh, and when I was in China, um, like taxi drivers, people ask me all the time where I was from, because they can tell you're not from there, because one, like, I don't know what teacher means. <laughs> and two, I don't have the same kind of intonation when I speak Mandarin. And uh, so they're usually, they, they go, oh, you're a, they, so there's two different words in Chinese. There's one called Wai Di Ren, which means outsider. And then there's Wai Guo Ren, which means foreigner. So they usually ask me like, are you an outsider? And I'll be like, wow, like, how can you tell I'm from this part, from Jiangsu province? And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I've been there. Or like, oh, that's a beautiful place. They'll exchange that. And then they'll be like, but you don't quite look like you're from the, there either. And then I'll be like, oh, actually, my family moved to Canada a long time ago. And then that's where the point of interest becomes, uh, where, where the point of interest comes in. They go, oh, like your family lives like in a Western country. And then all of a sudden it becomes kind of a prestigious thing. And then they like to ask, how much do you make? How much do your parents make? Do you drive a Lamborghini? Yes. <laughs> and I'm just like, no, no, like it's, we're not swimming in gold over there. <laughs> like everyone is like, we're just normal people, right? But yeah, so I, my, my, uh, because, you know, I'm just from China. I think that makes it, makes that question of where are you from a lot more um, complicated here in Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember you telling that story about the, the money and laughing at, at the, at the uh, assumptions that are sometimes made about being, um, being in, can in Canada when you're going to these, uh, these different countries. Okay. Um, I think for me, I, a big part of the work that I do is in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I do training programs. I support organizations as they're learning and unlearning. I'm introducing different, um, one, of the, one of the things that's very important for me when I'm doing the training that I do is that I don't speak for a community. I make it a point of inviting a community to speak 
about their own experiences. I don't speak for somebody else's experience. So I feel like I, I am surrounded by the language and the words so much. And I speak, um, I speak about diversity in a way that is so much more than the color of your skin, uh, which I think is sometimes lost on, on people. Oftentimes when you think of diversity, you think of, you know, what country were you born in? What color is your skin? Um, but diversity has so much more to it. So I think when I'm asked that question here, I'm excited about the opportunity to talk about where that, what the intention is behind that. Um, and that's just from a selfish standpoint, because I want to understand what your intention is. Are you looking to learn more about myself? Because I'm always happy to share. I have a bit of a hybrid culture being that my mom's from East Africa, my dad's from India. I'm born and raised here. Um, and so, you know, I own my privilege and I also share, um, you know, some of the, some of the areas of, of unconscious bias that people may have towards me. And I'm happy to challenge that. When I went back to India, I had a very hard time because where you're from, uh, Linton, similar to you in that, you know, being a, being a woman brought me down a notch, unfortunately, uh, but I was still Canadian. And Canadian definitely had a point of privilege and I had a sense of pride. However, from a, again, a safety perspective, um, you didn't want to brag about the fact that you were Canadian. And I never thought about being Canadian as a point of bragging. Um, I'm proud, I'm very, very proud to be born and raised in Canada, but I'd never thought about it from the perspective that my dad had, which was a perspective of fear of, you need to be mindful of who you're telling uh, where you're from and what intention they have when they're asking you that. So again, for that question, I, I'm excited to get that question when I'm here because I feel really equipped to answer it. I feel very strong in my answer. I feel very confident with how I, how I believe um, those situations to be. And I'm also really comfortable if it doesn't go the right way to move the conversation along. I don't really feel rattled. But when I was in India, I was afraid. And so uh, something that I've always been proud of, I had to sort of suppress and not talk about. Um, and it's constant, constant in India that you, they would ask, where are you from? Where are you from? And you kind of just have to say, oh, I'm, I'm from Canada and move the conversation along. So mm -hmm. very, very different experiences getting that question in two different countries. Yeah, it's amazing what wrapped up in just a few words, right? Yeah. And, and depending on your location. And uh, one thing that I have started doing is um, it's been a while since someone's asked me, like, actually, where are you from in a way that suggests that I'm not from Canada, like while I'm here, when I'm here, but um, I've started asking the question back. So I think one of the beefs that people have with that question is it's usually directed at people of color, um, as if to say that because they are a person of color, they're from somewhere else and not Canada. So I usually will ask the question back, even if it is a white person, and I will just say like, and where are you from? And I actually have a friend who's like 12th generation Canadian, um, but I, I still challenged her and I still said like, but where are you from originally? Where's your family from originally? And then she said, you know, England and France. And, and then it was kind of like, yeah, because unless we're indigenous, we are actually from, we're all actually from somewhere. Um, but yeah, there's a lot behind the intent of that question, though, that, that, uh, you know, holds all that emotion with it as well. Okay, and I just want to jump into the Q&A because I actually did see um, some things I wanted to bring up now. Okay, so Zafira is asking, having experienced a trip back to your roots at the ages and life stage that you all did, do you think there is an ideal time or stage in life to make that journey back? Or is it like whenever you get the chance to go? Anyone want to take that question? Hmm. Yeah, I would. I. So, I mean... I think if anybody has the privilege to do that, to do that, then to make it, I don't know, as soon as possible, because there's something about reconnecting with your root that it's, it's a feeling that you really can't get anywhere else. And like for Linton, he said that when he went back, he was like, oh, this is like, I, I'm indigenous to this land. Mm -hmm. And that, that was one thing I felt as well when I was in China is that I never had to question whether somebody treated me a certain way because of the way I look. Um, and that's, 
it's, it's like a peace of mind and, and, and uh, just in everyone around you that look like you, there's a little bit of comfort in that as well. As much as, you know, being in Canada, one of the things I love being in Canada for is how diverse we are. But once in a while, when you go back to your homeland, you feel that peace that you don't quite get um, in, a di- in a very diverse country. And, um, and I know, Taslim, you mentioned that you went back to Kenya with your father and he hadn't been back for 40 years. And even then, it's a very emotional roller coaster. So I would say, like, if you have the chance to go, like, go. And I, I try to go uh, as much as possible just so that I can see my grandparents because they raised me as well. So, yeah, highly recommend. <laughs> I think I would say go. I think there there's an acknowledgement of privilege to be able to go back home, go back home. Um, and I say that intentionally because I... For me, I didn't go back home. I went back to my dad's home. Um, And so for me, I think the stage I went in, I had the ability to acknowledge the experience. But if I had the opportunity to take my seven and four-year-old, I would do that now and have them experience it with their grandfather. Um, I would take them to Africa in a heartbeat with my mom. I would would go again as a grandma and take my grandkids and show them what their grandparent, great grandparents were like, I mean, I think any stage in your life, there's going to be, um, there's going to be so much opportunity in going back home. Um, and just so much power in that phrase, going back home, even, uh, even knowing that that wasn't home for me, it's still a part of me, um, that, that Canada can't be. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really great opportunity. And I think, just being mindful that we acknowledge that it is a privilege to go. So if you can take it, do it. Linton, do you agree? Oh, I completely agree. Multiple times. Go. (laughs) (laughs) It doesn't matter what life stage you're at, just keep going. Um, But I think if you're wondering at what point should I start going, it's when you ask yourself that question and, you know, it's like, I have in mind to go like, oh, I should go. Maybe I should do it. Just do it. Yeah. You'll figure it out along the way, you'll get there, um, and you'll be able to craft a great experience for yourself, but also go in with an open mind, right? Like, again, like I said about trying to, like, going back to the village, might not exist anymore in the same way that you have been told that it existed. So just have an open mind, because things have changed, maybe since you, you've you been told about those stories, or those, told, those stories have been told to you. So I think it's really important. Um, I'll share another story with you and kind of what, what precipitated for me and what catalyzed this whole idea about being indigenous uh, to China and something I didn't realize or think of or even conceive of before was because the very first time that I went to my mom's village, my mom's dad's village, um, I felt a profound sense of connection to that place. Mm-hmm. I've never seen it before. I've never been there before. I haven't seen images. I've just seen pictures. I've never seen anything before there. But I found a, I felt like this deep connection to it in a way that I've never felt a connection to place ever before in my life and it was only after I'd come back and dwelled upon it deconstructed it thought about it that I realized I felt connected to that place because I exist today because of all the sacrifices the blood the sweat the tears the, the successes the joys the laughter the smiles of the people that lived there I can trace back my genealogy my ancestry to those places 10 generations 50 generations 100 generations and it was this sense of connection that gave me so much sense of confidence and power that I had never felt before ever in my life and I connected it back here in BC in the way that indigenous people in BC talk about their connection to space connection to land I conceptually Mm -hmm. understand it I intellectually understand it but I've never felt it in the way that I felt it there and now I feel that I can relate better to that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why I would always recommend if you have the privilege, you have the ability to go and visit your ancestral places, definitely go for it. Yeah, absolutely. And, wow. and thank you, Linton, for bringing that up. Uh, we really can't have this conversation about indigeneity without speaking about the indigenous people in this country. And um, And same thing, as soon as I started questioning, like, where do I belong? What land can I lay claim to? I thought about the Indigenous people here 
and started understanding a little bit more about you know what what they have gone through and what they're going through and just that whole um you know trying to get back your identity like it's your your everything is so wrapped up right your identity and home and it's like where do you belong and who are you those are questions that you know many of us think about I think in our generation questions I actually am trying to get my children to think about so I'll, I'll often ask them you know like so what are you you know and just see what they say and um, someone in the chat asked um, do you find that you live separate cultures African or Indian or Chinese or Canadian and that kind of ties in in nicely to like what are you or how do you identify what's your identity um, do you what do you say when someone asks you how do you identify I like this idea of being a navigator that I'm not boxed into certain categories mm -hmm. but I'm able to navigate between spaces between places um, so say for example, here in Vancouver, I can go to a, a restaurant, like a Chinese restaurant and enjoy the food and not be questioned about it. Whereas I can imagine that someone who's non-Chinese can go to the same place, and not have the same experience as me. Um, whereas like, I can also participate in a more Western style, like pub or like, you know, go to an Irish bar or something like that. And I won't be questioned either. So I have this ability to navigate spaces um in ways that a lot of people can't hear and the same thing for me when i travel i get to do the same thing i get to navigate between spaces in ways that other people can't so i'm fortunate and i recognize that, a lot, that i'm fortunate in that way mm -hmm. yeah i think that's where that term bicultural also comes into identify it's how i identify as well um you know where you can be in in different contexts and and kind of slip into them you know, a little bit seamlessly. Sometimes it's not so seamless. Like when I try to go shopping at the Indian Bazaar <laughs> in Surrey, BC, and like can't really navigate that, I realize without my mom or an aunt around. So um, yeah, those are great questions uh, from you attendees. Thank you so much. I just wanna make sure that we're not missing. Um, I think somebody also asked mm -hmm. about how we stay relevant to the cultures yeah. that we're from? I think that's a really, really good question. Um, I myself am absolutely privileged to be living in Vancouver where there's a very large East Asian population, a very large Chinese population. And for me, that is a very big connection uh, for myself. Um, however, um, for my specific culture, where I'm from, there's actually not that big of a community here. Um, I would say that the Chinese Canadian community here in Vancouver is still majority majority Cantonese, which is from a um, which is where Linton's ancestors are from, the kind of southern um, southeast coast of China. And um, so a lot of times, like I do find that I, I have to do a little bit more explaining to people, which I absolutely love as well, like, you know, sharing where I'm, I'm from. And honestly, a good way for me to stay connected to the culture is YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's just, there's a lot of talented people on there who, who love sharing their, their hobbies and their, their skills and whether it be cooking videos or music instruments. Um, I watch a lot of that on YouTube, actually, when I feel really homesick. Um, I actually have a Spotify playlist called like homesick <laughs> and I'll listen to music from um, from my like motherland when I when I do feel that that really aching feeling. And um, and I guess just talking to my parents, I, I ask them a lot about uh, about what their lives were like growing up and what what, how Canada has been like for them. As I've gotten older, I've actually found um, that I'm starting to connect deeper with my parents. Um, I think that comes from just, you know, growing out of like angst and stuff like that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that they have a lot of really interesting insight to share with me that I, I wouldn't have expected before. Like they, Sometimes I wonder, you know, like sometimes I have very, this very defensiveness when, 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 the, when faced with confrontations, whereas my parents will be like, well, 
there was one point where we didn't know what the norms were. And, and you know, like we had to learn our, our way through. And so I find that having these conversations with my parents is, yeah, it's a good way to feel connected to that. Yeah. I think for me, my faith has really been uh, where I have managed to stay the most connected. Um, and that's sort of where, I know we talk a lot about the disparity and, and some of the, the, you know, we have the different cultures and we have different understandings and we have different um, backgrounds and different feelings of, um, you know, where you feel like you are Indigenous to. Um, but for me, it all sort of comes together um, within my faith. And so I've been very fortunate that um, both my parents um, are practice. And so I get to, I get to see their you know, they're the base of everything that they do, which starts from their faith and that we're sort of, um, I'm just grateful that I'm, I'm tagging along and they're teaching me through that faith. So um, that's really allowed me to stay connected um, and build community through that. So that's been, been an area that I'm very, very grateful for. Mm-hmm. And where Thus and I connected as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is a continuity, right? When, when we follow those kinds of traditions that uh, just become a part of who we are. Um, yeah. It makes it, it, yeah, I agree. It makes it easier to kind of be in different places, but still feel kind of grounded in who you are because there's that like um, a different kind of a search of who you are that's, you know, goes past any other um, definitions, right? Yeah, yeah, it just allows you to stay connected in a way that doesn't always have to be defined by words. And I'm mindful of the environment when I say beyond words, um, it is <laughs> as I'm saying that, but it's sometimes nice to not have to articulate it in words, but to really just feel it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I just some really great questions here. Esmeralda is asking, and by the way, Esmeralda has been putting book recommendations in the chat. And I have both those books that you're talking about, Esmeralda. And I didn't realize that you were one of the contributors um, to the, in that book of, by Caitlin, Pre- uh, published through Caitlin Press. So now I'm going to have to go back and read your story. But Esmeralda is asking if any of you experience a conflict of culture or values after moving to Canada. So um, this might be more relevant to Angie. Um, Did you try to adapt to a Canadian lifestyle while your parents still held values from your country of birth? Yeah, I, that's something that's still like a daily struggle. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think that's something that I'll live with probably like with me, that'll be with me forever. Um, It's part of my identity, that struggle, Um, which, you know, used to be kind of I used to find a very difficult thing like sometimes like why can't I just have like one set of values to choose from but I'm starting to see that it's a good thing and that um, you know I guess one of the one of the privileges of being an immigrant is that I start over Um, this family tree has been like uprooted right so I get to rebuild whatever tree there is Um, my dad's mom was a uh, favorited boys over girls. And, um, and that's not the value that I was raised because my mom's side of family are absolutely lovely and they're absolutely like pro feminist, pro equality. And um, so there were a lot of traditions um, from that side that I was not a fan of. And I guess one of the, one of the good things is that I get to kind of start over and pick the values that I like Mm -hmm. and continue my family tree with those Um, but I think yeah I honestly I could probably write a whole book about that conflict so I I don't even know how to answer that question I'm sorry it's just it's so difficult and it's just I think it's a different journey for everyone to to find a good balance especially if they have very, very opposing um, values, like my Chinese values versus my Western values. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think independence is probably one of those things that is the biggest thing for me is, um, you know, I'm I'm, I'm 30 this year and uh, my mom has to fend off all these calls from the homeland about why I'm not yet married and why I don't have kids yet. And it's just one of those things where I'm like, 
you know, just, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can relate to that. And I am writing a book about that <laughs> uh, because it, it is a huge, uh, even though I was came to Canada before I was a year old, I feel like I grew up with two cultures, one at home and one outside the home. And I could actually relate to both, which was tricky. Um, but I find it now it's pretty rich because as I raise my kids, I can pick and choose like the values of, for example, community from that comes from my Indian East African background and the values of, um, you know, following your own heart, which comes from the Canadian um, upbringing that I've had. So, so I think, yeah, we get to pick and choose and it's not always easy. It's definitely not easy to grow up that way. Um, but there are always benefits, I think. Yeah, uh, as, as Meralda just mentioned that he's asking for his kid. And I guess from the perspective of that, who was that kid was just um, pass down the values that you really care about. Like my parents really emphasize things on things like education and being kind and just being a good person and everything else, just leave it to your kids. And uh, if you raise them to be, to hold those values that you value, then you trust them to, pick and choose the values that matters to them and then they'll be happy. Yeah. I like, to, I like to say that the caveat to this is that culture changes and to recognize that it changes. So, I mean, the Chinese traditions that I was brought up with are encapsulated at a very particular point in time because my parents learned it from their parents, which is also from a very particular point in time. And those traditions, those things have evolved and changed over time since they were taught. Uh, my parents grew up in apartheid South Africa. South Africa is a very different place now, right? Mm -hmm. So um, some of the values that they grew up with under apartheid South Africa kind of conflicts with how South Africa is now. So, you know, I, when I talk to um, people from South Africa or, you know, people that I'm from South Africa who I meet here, like their stories are very different than my parents and the way that I was taught or that I was learned. Uh, or that I learned. So just understand that culture does change, things change. So to understand how, again, maybe going back to the other question of how you stay relevant is how important is that to you to stay relevant and to understand how things have changed and evolved over time? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, we're getting some really great feedback. I hope our panelists are reading, um, people appreciating all your perspectives on identity, culture, and belonging. Um, this is a really important topic um, in Canada because so many of us, and we can see how diverse we are even just on the screen here, um, and yet we share so many similar um, concerns and perspectives and gratitudes. And um, yeah, so thank you all for sharing. We just have like one or two more minutes left. Is there anything pressing that the panelists would like to share before we leave? Take that trip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I'll come with you. So. Yeah, post -COVID. Post -COVID. Yeah. yeah. I think if, if there's, you know, one takeaway, it's that no matter how much we talk about and how many experiences you hear and how many stories we share, every single one of us is going to be experiencing this from a different way um, with different experiences, even if we have the exact same cultures and backgrounds and faiths and educations and privileges and even if everything lines up the same, everything is, is still going to be different. So um, I love that you invited us here today to share our stories and treat us as individuals because every person that you walk by on the street and you ask where they're from, you cannot make the assumption that you have any idea what experiences they have had or how they are going to answer that question. So um, I really appreciate Word Vancouver acknowledging each of us um, in, in a way that we create some type of um, cohesiveness in the stories that we have. But at the end of the day, all of our experiences are individual and all of our experiences are, are ones that are meant to be shared and talked about. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And on that note, thanks to everyone who's attending. And um, again, the festival is free uh, because of the support of our sponsors and all of you. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Check out some more Word Vancouver programming. There's really great stuff lined up. Thanks thank so much. You. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.